<laughs> okay, so it's my great pleasure to introduce Fridolin, uh, Fridolin Gross uh, from uh, the University of Kassel. Uh, Fridolin, uh, as several of you already know, is currently a postdoctoral researcher at the Fiat Institute of Molecular Oncology in Milan, uh, in Italy. And at the same time, um, he's a teacher of philosophy in the Department of Philosophy at the <coughs> University of Kassel. So you can already see that uh, Fridolin has some sort of both double background and double functions, being both a philosopher and uh, a, a biologist. Um, he got his PhD from the uh, European School of Molecular Medicine in Milan. He did a PhD entitled The Sum of the Parts, Heuristic Research Strategies in Systems Biology, under the supervision of uh, Mark Bedeau, uh, who is a specialist of emergence and artificial life and other uh, very interesting topics. Uh, what is striking in the CV of Fridolin is the fact that he has very good publications both in uh, philosophy and in uh, science. Um, in philosophy, uh, papers in different journals, including uh, um, the, in the journal History and Philosophy of the Life Sciences, uh, a chapter uh, called Towards a Methodology for Systems Biology in the volume edited by Sarah Green. Sarah Green visited us uh, at least twice or three times in the last two years. Uh, so the book is called Philosophy of Systems Biology. Uh, Fidelin also wrote a paper called What Systems Biology Can Tell Us About Disease, which I think could be of interest to some of you. In biology, he wrote a series of different papers, often in collaboration with other, of course, uh, uh, biologists and sometimes other scientists, including recently a paper in PLOS Computational Biology, another in Current Biology, still another in eLife, and the paper in eLife, I think, is interesting for several of us, uh, including because it is about IL-2 and Tervakin-2, and also it is a paper that uh, adopts a systems perspective in uh, immunology, which is not that frequent. Uh, Fidelin also has a paper in the European Journal of Immunology, also another in eLife, and still another in the Journal of Theoretical Biology. So also about uh, uh, immunology, it is called Mathematical Modeling of Allergy and Specific Immunotherapy, TH1, TH2, TREG Interactions. So you can see the diversity of uh, topics and approaches that characterize the, uh, uh, characterizes the work of uh, Fridolin. Very recently, he wrote a paper for the Journal of Philosophy of Science. The Journal of Philosophy of Science is clearly the most famous journal of philosophy of science, founded in 1934. So it is the dream of every philosopher of science to have a paper published in philosophy of science. So this is now the case for Fidelin, and that paper is called Occam's Razor in Molecular and Systems Biology, which is exactly what Fidelin is going to talk about today. Remember that Fidelin is still with us for six days, or seven days, I think. So, if you, Wednesday, next Wednesday. So if you want to interact with him, it is still possible until uh, next Wednesday. Fidelin, thank you very much, first, for having accepted our invitation in Bordeaux, and second, for having accepted to uh, present your work today. Well, thanks very much for the kind introduction, and thanks for having me here in Bordeaux. It's been a really great time. And I'm really sad to see that it's almost over. Yeah, and before I leave, uh, I will tell you a story about uh, Occam's razor. And very roughly, Occam's razor is the idea that simpler theories are somehow better. It's also called the law of parsimony. And so the aim of this talk is to understand what the role of this principle might be in molecular and systems biology, and whether an analysis in terms of the principle of Occam Fraser can somehow shed light on the relationship of these different disciplines or fields. So I assume that most of you know or have heard of systems biology, but very briefly, uh, systems biology can be probably best understood as a response to the situation biology was in at the beginning of the 21st century, so after the Human Genome Project and the other large sequencing 
projects, biologists were somehow faced with lots of data, lots of information, but uh, very few ideas on how to transform this data and information into biological understanding. And so the idea was we need a somehow, we need a new biology that helps us uh, to deal with this problem. And the idea was that a systems biology that is based on the integration of large data sets and the application of computational tools allows us to um, understand biology at the systems level. And so there's been a lot of discussion about what exactly systems biology is apart from that and what its relationship is to the traditional approach of molecular biology. And so what's interesting for philosophers is that a lot of this discussion by the scientists is uh, framed in philosophical terms. Uh, and um, yeah, so sometimes uh, systems biology is described as a, a radical break with the tradition of molecular biology, that we are in the midst of a paradigm shift in the sense of the philosopher Thomas Kuhn, or that uh, the approaches are completely different in the sense that molecular biology is reductionistic and systems biology is holistic. And so there might be some work for philosophers to do in maybe clarifying some of these debates with their experience in conceptual analysis and their knowledge of the history of some of these uh, philosophical concepts. And so a lot has been written about uh, reductionism and holism. And so here I want to focus on yet another way in which this discussion has been framed philosophically, and that is in terms of the principle of Occam's razor. So there has been, have been system, uh, systems biologists who think that, well, maybe the fundamental difference between systems biology and molecular biology lies in uh, uh, yeah, the application of that very principle. And that there is maybe some need of clarification in that context illustrated by this quote by another systems biologist, which is incidentally in the same volume uh, edited by Sarah Mir that Thomas mentioned. So the famous systems biologist Eberhard Boyd uh, writes, when asked, where can philosophers be useful in biology? Um, philosophers might join a discussion about the widely accepted 14th century dogma of which essentially states that the simpler of two explanations is to be preferred. At first, the concept makes much sense, as we certainly do not want to clutter our thinking or theories with details that are not needed. Yet the more we study biological systems, the more often we find enormous redundancy and could quite easily imagine simpler systems that would perform the same task. So this is one of the very rare occasions where a scientist uh, calls philosophers to help. Um, and yeah, so how is the issue of Occam's razor then related to, uh, to systems biology in particular? And so the basic argument that systems biologists put forward, so systems biologists like Westerhoff, the author of the paper that I showed, um, is that, well, molecular biology in some sense strives for simple explanations of living systems. And this is wrong, because the assumptions underlying Occam's razor actually do not hold in biology, so similar to the idea that Boyd uh, um, alluded to in his quote. And systems biology, by contrast, provides more adequate methods to deal with the biological complexity and therefore can afford to drop the principle of Occam's razor altogether. So the question is, does this argument work? And to evaluate this argument, we have to understand better what actually uh, Occam's razor consists in and what these assumptions are. So the aim of this talk is to make use of the history of philosophy to discuss uh, different ways in which Occam's razor 
has been understood and justified to defend molecular biology actually by arguing that its use of Occam's razor is largely innocuous. So here I'm trying to take the side of the underdog because it seems to me at least that many philosophers somehow sympathize with the kind of the idea of a new holistic science and uh, yeah. So this is a bit counteracting this tendency maybe. Um, in addition, to further defend molecular biology, I want to show that considerations of simplicity actually play a crucial role in systems biology as well. And finally, maybe the, the larger take home message from this talk is that this perspective in terms of simplicity and Occam's razor sheds light on uh, how the two approaches might be interact and complement uh, each other in fruitful ways. Okay, so what is Occam's Razor actually about? I will start with a brief um, historical introduction. Usually um, the principle is traced back to Aristotle and his uh, dictum that nature does nothing in vain. And uh, actually Aristotle uses this expression mostly in his biological writings. So he gives, for example, the, uh, he gives the example of the fact that uh, no organism has both lungs and gills. So nature is parsimonious in the sense that it avoids redundancy. In Occam himself, um, the principle got a more general and more methodological flavor, usually um, it's expressed in the form that entities are not to be multiplied beyond necessity, even though Occam himself uh, has never said this. But in his writing you also have, uh, uh, you see this methodological principle at work. For example, when he argues that um, we shouldn't assume that matter in the heavens differs from matter on earth. So he says, because it's, it's uh, to assume the difference would may, uh, mean to make an unfounded assumption. And uh, the principle in a very similar way is also underlying really the modern scientific worldview since it figures very prominently in Isaac Newton's uh, Principia Mathematica. So in his first rule of reasoning, he essentially um, with reference back to Aristotle, uh, he argues that no more causes of natural things should be admitted than are both true and sufficient to explain the phenomena. And really the achievements of Newton in the uh, realm of physics can really be understood as, as big unifying and uh, simplifying achievements by arguing that we don't need separate explanation for the motion of an apple on Earth and, uh, the celestial motions of the, of the planets. However, um, this principle has led to philosophical puzzles. And the main philosophical questions about Occam's razor are first, what does the principle actually say exactly? So how should we interpret uh, simpler theories are better? And the even more important question is, how can it be justified? So I will briefly go through these two questions in more detail. Regarding the first question of the interpretation of Occam's razor, uh, usually people disting uh, distinguish between two broad ways of interpreting the principle. The first way is an ontic interpretation, so where one says that Occam's razor is about uh, the simplicity of the world, basically. So here the idea is, according to Occam's razor, a simpler theory uh, means a theory that has a smaller ontological commitment, meaning it assumes less entities or less causes, less processes, etc. An example where ontic, uh, an ontic version of Occam's razor might be at work is um, Einstein's uh, theory of special relativity, 
um, because the theories that came before all assumed uh, this medium in which the electromagnetic waves um, are transmitted and Einstein's theory was thought to be superior among other reasons because it could do away with this additional entity. Um, the other way of interpreting Occam's razor is uh, an epistemic interpretation, so we're not directly interested with the simplicity of the world, the number of objects or causes, but we, are <coughs> we talk about um, the simplicity of our descriptions. Sometimes this is referred to as elegance, and the ontic interpretation is parsimony, but I will not uh, use that distinction here. An example here of epistemic parsimony um, that is often used is uh, the preference of the heliocentric worldview of Copernicus and Kepler and Galilei. Um, uh, over the geocentric astronomy. So the idea was um, we're talking about the same system, the same object, but somehow one perspective must be in some sense truer because it just has this uh, geometrical simplicity. That's at least how the story is often interpreted. Um, so much about the interpretation. Um, just note that there are different ways of understanding the principle and of understanding simplicity. Both of these views, of course, are not straightforward. An ontic interpretation, one might think, is simpler because we just count the objects and then we have a measure for simplicity. But of course, this depends on how we slice up the world into different objects. And that's a big fundamental philosophical question, of course. In the epistemic interpretation, the problem is well, to find the right measure of simplicity of our theories. This is also not straightforward, and often it seems uh, how simple a theory is somehow dependent on the language that we use to express it. So there are many uh, more specific debates going on about some aspects of uh, these, both, uh, both of these interpretations. Um, okay. In terms of justification, even more different ways have been proposed in which we can um, justify Occam's razor. Of course, we often prefer simpler theories because um, we just can work with them more easily or we find them more beautiful. Um, and that's an obvious justification for why to scientists uh, sometimes prefer simpler theories. But the philosophically more interesting question is, well, why should um, why should there be any connection between what our theories, what we want our theories to be like, and what the world is like? Actually, so there's no reason to to, to assume that these simpler theories must be better, at least at, the, at first sight. But so the traditional way in Newton and his contemporaries. Uh, was simply to argue that, well, the simple theories are more likely to be true because nature itself is simple. And usually the argument was, well, that there's a rational creator behind all this and he has basically the same preference uh, that we have for simplicity. Um, towards the 19th century, there have been more attempts to understand whether there's, there are ways of defending the principle in uh, non-theological terms. So one way of arguing would be to say, well, for some reason, simpler theories have higher probability. So many people have attempted to go in this direction. There is the attempt to argue that simpler theories have higher likelihood, which is a different kind of um, justification. I will say uh, more about this in a moment. Some people argue that simpler theories have higher predictive power. Then there is Popper's perspective, according to which simpler theories are more better because they're more falsifiable. So yet another perspective. And finally, there's the idea that simpler theories are better because they're more explanatory. So they have this unifying power um, 
and we can explain more with less. So in that sense, the the the, the more explanatory efficient. And so then the question, given all these different attempts to justify uh, Occam's razor, one can ask, is there any unity to justifying Occam's razor? Is there any simplicity behind this principle of simplicity? And so recently there has been a book by Elliot Sova, and already from the title you can tell that his answer is no. So he, uh, deliberately uses the plural of Occam's razors because he says, well, simplicity can be justified in very different ways depending on the context. And I will draw on Sober's work in order to now uh, give a bit more detail about certain attempts uh, of justifying the principle that will be relevant then for the rest of my talk. So the first idea is uh, that sometimes simpler theories have higher probability. So maybe a very, I mean, we work on that basis in everyday life all the time. Uh, basically, so for example, imagine that you see a person walking in the streets that you have already met but you don't know very well. And so one theory is it's the same person that you have. And the other theory is, well, it's the identical twin. And both of these theories explain your observation uh, equally well. But one would probably say, well, the simpler theory of assuming it's the same person is much more probable. And this argument works based on the assumption <coughs> that identical twins are quite rare. So we use an empirical information to justify simplicity in this case. So that's important. It's not an argument that box works a priori. But in the same way, scientists often expect simple explanations based on certain empirical assumptions, as we will see later. So that's a relatively straightforward way in which uh, simpler theories are sometimes better. Um, there's actually even one way in which this argument works a priori. And John Stuart Mill, the 19th century philosopher, actually thought, well, that's the explanation for Arkham Fraser. It's, in a sense, trivial. Um, so he was arguing against people who try to invoke uh, God uh, in order to, uh, and the simplicity of nature to, to justify uh, our preference for simpler theory. And he says, the law of parsimony needs no such support. It rests on no assumption respecting the ways of proceedings of nature. It is a purely logical precept, a case of the broad practical principle not to believe anything of which there is no evidence. The assumption of a superfluous cause is a belief without evidence, as if we were to suppose that a man who was killed by falling over a precipice must have taken poison as well. Yeah? So, this is what Elliot Sober refers to as the razor of silence. We simply don't mention uh, additional causes and hypotheses or theories that would make additional and un unfounded assumptions are simply less likely to be true. So this argument can be phrased in probabilistic terms because it simply uh, directly follows from the axiom of probability theory according to which the probability of one event or proposition is always greater than the conjunction of that proposition with another one. So there's this famous example by Daniel Kahneman so they uh, where, 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 where he argues that people sometimes uh, violate this probabilistic theorem or axiom actually. Um, so the, the, the experiment is that uh, he describes a woman to people saying, well, she's very politically aware and uh, confident and likes to speak her mind and then ask to people, what do you think is more probable, that she is a bank teller or that she is a bank teller and is active in the feminist 
And then most people actually think the second theory is more likely, even though it's uh, contradicted by logic. So in the same sense, um, it's always better to hold a theory that is more general because it will be more likely, it will be more likely to be true. Um, so that <coughs> is one way. This, the analogy is with agnosticism versus atheism, right? So it's in a sense a better theory to say, well, I don't know if God exists, but I don't need God in my worldview. Uh, that's the more probable theory than to say, well, God does not exist. So the razor of silence is a kind of agnostic version of Hoffman's razor. And Elliot Zorba remarks, yes, well, this is all good, but in some cases we are actually not only silent about additional unfounded assumptions, but we might want to make the stronger point that, well, certain causes actually don't exist. And this is not true in general, that the conjunction <coughs> of our theory with the negation of this additional uh, assumption, that the probability of this is higher than the probability of the conjunction. So this is not backed up by logic. And this is what Adil Sober refers to of as the razor of denial. So the razor of silence basically works a priori. The razor of denial would need further justification. Um, a similar version can be made for an epistemic perspective on possibility. So the version I presented now, it's basically an ontic version of the razor of silence, but we can also find an epistemic version of the razor of silence, and this seems to be something that Quine had in mind when uh, speaking about simplicity. So here he uses uh, the example of reporting experimental measurements, and he says the simpler hypothesis of measuring or reporting 5.2 as against 5.21 it's quite genuinely 10 times likelier to be confirmed just because 10 times as much deviation is tolerated under the head of confirmation. And so the, the point is essentially the same. In these cases, the simpler theory is more likely to be true because it's somehow it's more inclusive and more general. Okay. The next kind of justification of that can sometimes be used to defend stronger versions of the principle of Occam's razor is in terms of likelihood. So likelihood is a technical term that does not refer to the probability of the theory, but to the probability of the data given the theory. So what probability it confers to what we observe. And the likelihood of uh, a theory can, however, using Bayes' theory, then be related to the posterior probability of the theory. So, to give an example, um, a teacher receives two essays by um, his students and he sees that these are identical. So, he can have the theory that, well, they independently happened to write exactly the same essay. Or the other theory could be, well, there was some kind of common cause behind that. And in that case, the common cause explanation is superior, more probable, not because of its a priori probability, but because it can explain the observed data much better. So that the theory of separate causes would make it much, much more improbable that uh, the result would actually be what we observe. Another example, more science related, is the universality of the genetic code. So, very similar, we observe that in all species, uh, we have the way, same way in which uh, DNA is translated into protein. And again, we can ask maybe it's a huge coincidence and uh, of the separately evolving uh, lineages. 
but of course the more parsimonious explanation is that there's some kind of common origin. And again, this can be justified formally in terms of uh, likelihood. And the, the probability the different theories confer on the data that we observe. However, I must say that this principle is very important in general for discussions about Occam's razor, but I want to argue that this doesn't play such a big role in the context that I'm interested in. Uh, by contrast, the last justification I want to present is very relevant, and that's the idea that sometimes simpler theories have more predictive power. So now we're not talking about the truth of truth of theories anymore, but a different kind of property. Um, so imagine that here we have uh, a series of measurements and uh, that shows the relationship between two variables. And we have a strong intuition that this model to then make predictions based on the observations is somehow superior to this model, right? So these are both mathematical theories that uh, are generated using the observations. But the point is that here we can also formally justify a version of Occam's razor um, that takes into account the fact, uh, the empir empirical data we have uh, available. So, and these results show that under certain statistical assumptions, simpler models actually have the greater predictive accuracy. So this is related to the problem of overfitting um, and that's a simple uh, representative of the data. Um, okay, to summarize this part, um, I have told you that simpler theories may prefer sometimes directly based on empirical assumptions Note that these assumptions are not necessarily assumptions about the simplicity of the world. Um, sometimes simpler theories are a priori more probable. That's what I meant with a razor of silence. Sometimes they're superior because they confer higher probability on the observations. That was the likelihood approach. And sometimes they're superior because they have higher probability. So now turning to actually uh, the case of molecular biology and systems biology. So why do we expect Occam's razor to be relevant in molecular biology? And one idea is that, well, molecular biology at the outset was a discipline that was to some extent created by actually by physicists coming in there, Francis Crick or Max Delbrick, um, and maybe they just brought their methodological vision from physics into that field. And this seems to be something that um, Westerhoff and his colleagues seem to have in mind. They say, well, Newton insisted on the prevalence of simple explanations for understandable but historical reasons. Occam's razor has become a paradigm for physics and for molecular and cell biology. So this sounds plausible, but the story is a bit more complicated because, of course, the biologists know that biology is somehow different from physics and uh, Crick himself um, noted that, well, what is found in biology is mechanisms. Mechanisms built with chemical components and that are often modified by other later mechanisms added to the earlier ones. While Occam's razor is a useful tool in the physical sciences, it can be a very dangerous implement in biology. It is thus very rash to use simplicity and elegance as a guide in biological research. So the point is, if parsimony appears in molecular biology, then probably in a very different form than in physics. It will not be parsimony in the sense of simple and elegant laws, but rather in terms of the guiding principles of mechanistic explanations. So, and that also seems the spirit um, of the argument by the systems biologists. Um, Westerhoff and I'll take the example of the production of ATP, and they note that um, conceptually it seems that um, 
well, from assumptions about biochemistry, um, one needs 14 proteins for this process. And they observed that one needs 374 proteins to uh, minimally sustain life. And then they argued, well, physics is accustomed to reduce its systems of study to two or three components, and if that does not work, then perhaps six. 374, the number of components that are needed to sustain life, is certainly not in the realm of simplicity. Using Occam's razor, we might therefore wish to explain biological formation of ATP in terms of the action of 14 proteins, but this is impossible as the 14 enzyme pathway cannot be disentangled from the functioning of 361 other gene products. So this seems to be an ontic version of the principle, so it's about the number of components, and they argue that um, explanations in terms of small mechanisms don't work because the parts of these mechanisms cannot be isolated from the rest. And if we look at typical examples of uh, the representations of mechanisms in biology, biology, we have to admit, well, yeah, they, they look pretty simple. So this is just an example of my favorite mechanism, the spindle assembly checkpoint mechanism. It's not very important <coughs> what the details are here, but it's important to note that this is somehow simple with respect to how complex a mechanism could be, given what we know about the number and diversity of cellular components. So one might think, well, yeah, maybe they have a point. Maybe this is actually uh, problematic. But as I said, I want to try to justify uh, the kind of simplicity we find here. And I'm going to mention three ways of justifying the the kind of simplicity in molecular biology. First, based on empirical assumptions. Secondly, by taking into account the discovery process of the mechanism. And finally, by arguing that a lot of it can be explained in terms of the razor of science that we saw earlier. So how does this work? First of all, the empirical justification. Um, there are arguments actually that have been made why we can expect certain explanations in terms of small mechanisms. For example, that biological systems are fundamentally modular. So we don't expect all parts of the system to, invo to be involved in all phenomena and evolutionary arguments have been put forward why we expect a certain modular architecture in biology. Uh, Another example would be the expectation of molecular specificity. So the idea that certain molecules only interact with a small number of other certain molecules. This assumption of molecular specificity immediately reduces the number of possible connections that we would expect in mechanistic explanation. I'm not saying that these empirical justifications necessarily work, and of course a lot of these assumptions are being questioned at the moment with new findings about the promiscuity of molecules and so on. I'm just saying there are ways to actually uh, defend uh, the application of, of uh, Occam's razor based on empirical assumptions. Furthermore, we have to note uh, that the proposed mechanistic explanations are not there in isolation themselves, but usually they are the result of a long discovery process. So if we followed Westerhoff's uh, idea, uh, molecular biologists would say, so how many components do I need to explain um, the checkpoint behavior, for example? Well, if I need six components, then I'm going to look for those six. But that's not at all how the discovery process worked, at least in the case of the spindle assembly checkpoint mechanism. If you look at the history of that mechanism, it started with mutagenic screens. So people try to systematically perturb all the possible components to see which are involved and there. So the aim was to really find all the components <coughs> that might influence the process. And ideally, even though this is of course uh, not necessarily written in practice, 
that should be an unbiased engineer-wide process. What I want to say is just that molecular biologists are not only interested in the sufficiency of a mechanistic account, which uh, Westerhoff and his colleagues seem to have implied, but they are actually also interested in finding all the possible components that might play a role. The more important point, however, is uh, <coughs> the way in which the razor of silence plays a role. So it's important to note that the mechanistic accounts put forward by the molecular biologists typically do not exclude the possibility of additional factors. So the discovery process usually doesn't have a definite endpoint. And if you look at the discussion section of any paper, you will find, well, there are spe speculations about additional factors that play a role and so on. So these mechanistic explanations are deliberately open and consistent with extension. And in that sense, the razor of silence is actually at work. The theory is more probable because it's not saying, well, these are the relevant components and these are all the relevant components, but it says, well, we have this, it's a sufficient explanation, but we're open to new factors that might also play a role. In that sense, it's basically safe. It's a justified use of the razor of science. Okay, is this the whole story? One might still be skeptical about this kind of cut -through. Not maybe based on the idea that it, the number of components or interactions is too small, but maybe based on the idea that, well, this is maybe a very simplistic representation of biological processes. Here it says, well, MCC blocks activation, but we know it's not just a simple process, it's a very complex dynamic process, and there are hundreds of copies of that molecule involved, and wouldn't we need a much more precise description for this process? Um, so, in other words, are the representations of biology too simple. And here, by way of justification, I would say, well, we can justify this again with the razor of silence. And the reason is that these informal accounts are actually more likely to be true than precise mathematical descriptions. The argument is the same that Quine gave with his uh, <coughs> um, when he talked about the precision of uh, measurements. So the informal description, for example, that molecular complex A activates B is more con uh, is consistent with more possible uh, realizations of that uh, process than a precise mathematical description. So this use of informal representations can, again, be justified based simply on, on a priori probabilistic arguments. And my point is that the uncomfortable feeling we have about the kind of informal cartoon representations of biology is lies not in their simplicity, but actually um, in its potential to give rise to misleading inferences. So what I mean with this uh, will maybe become clearer from looking at a very simple example. So here's the Goodwin oscillator, a very simple organizational scheme that can give rise to oscillations. And in this image you see an informal representation of the Goodwin oscillator. So it's a cartoon in a sense. And based on this informal representation we can explain why the system has the potential to oscillate. We can say that, well, A activates B, then B is active, B activates C, then C is active, well then C will inhibit A. A will not be active anymore, B will not be active anymore, C will not be active anymore, and then the cycle starts again, because the inhibition on A is removed. So that's a sufficient explanation of uh, why this system can give rise to oscillation. However, based on the simple informal accounts, we neglect that there are many other possibilities of behavior of this system. So when we 
describe this system in mathematical terms, we find out, well, only under certain circumstances do we see oscillations. Maybe only with certain parameter settings, or only if the inhibition of C on A is sufficiently nonlinear. So we have a grasp on a more fine-grained grasp on the behavior of the system. And so based on the informal account, we would be led to the inference that the system os oscillates, which might be wrong in, in some <coughs> contexts. So this is what I mean with when I say that it's not a problem of the simplicity per se, but it's a problem of influence. Yeah. So, um, and to go back to Quine's example, uh, it's like um, forgetting to take into account that sometimes 5 plus 5 is 11 when we take into account that the numbers are given with limited precision. So, oops. to summarize this part on, on molecular biology, I was arguing that simplicity in molecular biology might be defended in different way. First, one might defend it based on empirical assumptions, one might defend it based on the razor of silence, both in its ontic and epistemic versions. Given all this, there are two caveats. First, of course, these empirical assumptions might be questions, but this leads more into scientific questions, empirical questions rather than philosophical ones. And the second point to take into account is that informal representations can be misleading for inferential purposes. How much time do I have left? Mm, ten minutes? Ten minutes. Yeah, yeah that's, that's sufficient. So I will briefly talk about the role of Occam's razor in systems biology. So one might think that, well, systems biology makes use of big data set, it makes use of highly sophisticated computational methods, so maybe it can do away with uh, Occam's razor, maybe it can just address the complexity of biology up front. So then it might come as a surprise that um, actually in the introductory textbook by Yuri Alon, one of the very famous uh, systems biologists, um, he dedicates a whole section to simplicity in biology. And um, among other things he says, there is no a priori reason that immensely complex biological systems would be understandable. But despite the fact that biological networks evolve to function and not to be comprehensible, simplifying principles can be found that make biological design understandable to us. So he argues that even systems biology can only work based on certain <coughs> conditions uh, that uh, the biological systems might and must fulfill. And as examples of simplicity uh, in biology, he mentions network motifs and modularity. So again, the idea that, well, in order to gain understanding from biological systems, we must somehow zoom in, break down, and look at smaller uh, modules of these systems. He also mentions design principles uh, like robustness, for example. So the idea is here that biological systems are not just randomly organized, but they must obey certain constraints, certain architectural principles, and, and therefore, yeah, show simplicity in a certain way that mirrors uh, the way that humans design and the kind of engineering principles that we, we know from, from human artifacts. And finally, he mentions the ability to use simple mathematical models. And here the idea is, well, maybe mathematical models do not have the aim to really capture the whole complexity of the system, but they're especially useful when, when they're simple. And this brings me to um, a point that connects both um, to the discussion of inferential power in, in, in molecular biology and on the justification of Occam's razor in terms of uh, predictive uh, abilities of models. 
So if you remember the Goodwin oscillator example, I said that formal models, mathematical models can avoid the problem of inference. They can lead to a more precise description of the system and therefore make our inferences more reliable in that sense. Um, however, we also saw that um, one justification of simplicity is to say, well, the complexity of the model somehow needs to be balanced against the available data. So we can build a big model that includes everything we know uh, about the system that we study, but the model is basically useless if we don't have the right data uh, to constrain it. And uh, otherwise we will not be able to make good predictions with that model. And so here we have a justification of Occam's razor in terms of the input power. And in my understanding this really lies at the root or is, 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 is everywhere in systems biology where you have uh, mathematical modeling. In order to have a useful model you have to have a model that is as simple as possible. Um, but as I mentioned, this justification of computational models in terms of predictive power uh, is different from the justification in terms of truth. So can we apply the razor of silence maybe also here to argue that the simpler models are more likely to be true? And so it's very important to be aware that the argument doesn't work with formal models. Formal models are logically inconsistent with possible extensions. Whereas the informal mechanisms that molecular biologists would put forward, we can say, well, they're open, they're silent about possible extension. When you define a formal model, it's in a sense closed. Yeah? When you add something to that model, you have a different model. So that version of Occam's razor doesn't work. Moreover, the precise descriptions that you need in order to make the model uh, a useful inferential tool actually at the same time make the model less likely to be true. So in other words, there's a trade-off between the truth and the predictive power of the model. And that's very important to take into account. So we have in that the situation that in both molecular biology and systems biology um, considerations of simplicity play a big role and there are versions of Occam's razor that can be defended in both domains. However, I've tried to argue that the justifications are different and it's different kinds of parsimony that are at work. So, to summarize the talk, I said that some systems biologists argue that molecular biology makes illegit illegitimate use of Occam's razor. I've tried to argue that many of the uses can be actually justified in terms of the razor of silence, which is innocuous because it's a priori. The simple informal models of molecular biologists are not necessarily wrong, but may fail as inferential tools. Formal models can assist as inferential tools, but the simplicity drives them away from the truth. Thank you very much. So let's take around 10 minutes for uh, discussion, questions, objections. Sophie. Thank you. I was thinking about machine, uh, listening to you, the, the, the machine model of uh, organism, living yes. organism. And I don't remember who said that maybe we, d we understand only what we can build. I don't remember where it comes from. This Feynman quote, I can, what I cannot create, I do not understand. Yeah. Maybe that one. Where, where, where is it from? This is Feynman. This is Feynman's back word, uh, Richard Feynman. It's Feynman. Okay, Feynman. So <coughs> and so, and, and the, the view of machine is really still very lively. I was in a debate on Tuesday and a guy said, a tree is a machine. Yes. And so I wonder how you can Related have some, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah so, so the, the Feynman quote is, what I cannot construct, I do not understand. Yeah. And That's just it. one <coughs> side note to this. So I, uh, I, I read somewhere that actually what, so it was on his blackboard, the last uh, uh, words on his blackboard, 
um, before he died. And um, it has always interpreted in this, in this way that it's somehow related also to biology. But I think what Feynman had in mind, but that's really just a side note, is, uh, is about constructing proofs, mathematical proofs. So um, he can only understand a mathematical theory or the, about a theory in physics if he can really derive the results uh, from first principles. But anyway, I mean, the, the point about the machine metaphor of, of organisms is very related. So it's an, another one. So the assumption of modularity, it it's, can be also considered as a specific application of, of the machine metaphor because we build systems in a modular way for certain reasons. And so we expect that, well, if nature builds machines, then it will use very similar principles. And, um, of course, yeah, and this is an empirical assumption that uh, there are important parallels between machines <coughs> and organisms, and um, so that's one way of justifying um, the preference for simple machinistic, no, not machinistic <laughs> theories in biology, but of course this assumption can be questioned, a question in the same way that the assumption of mobility <coughs> can be questioned or the assumption of specificity can be questioned that I mentioned. But I mean, this brings you into another discussion. So I mean, there's a lot of debate among philosophers about the uh, yeah, adequateness of the machine metaphor in biology. Uh, thank you very much for that very informative talk. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, in the end, when you talk about uh, assuming simple modules in the system of biology. In your mind, is it somewhat linked to um, like an ontological commitment to lower level entities? Because I have the feeling, but I haven't studied that very thoroughly, that system biology always starts from, let's say, very low level building blocks, either DNA, RNA, uh, bacteria, never with an organ. So is that another assumption? And how, if so, how does it relate to simple modules? Um, well, I think that, so, one issue here is that, well, systems biology is very heterogeneous. And, uh, so there's not one approach, and there are systems biology who try to model organs, like the heart, for example. Um, but you're right, um, simplicity comes in also when it comes to, for example, the choice of the organism that you that you study. So uh, I've written a paper about this idea of building a whole cell model. And of course, they start not with uh, a complex cell, but uh, they start with the simplest kind of bacterium that you can imagine, this mycoplasma genitalium, um, just because it has the smallest number of components. So of course, you have a very holistic vision because you're building a model of a whole cell but you have of course uh, these constraints and simplicity comes in in the way that well you choose the, the, the organism with the smallest number of components. I'm not sure if I ask, uh, answered your question. I can about, reformulate uh, the question following your yes. example. So if we take as an example and then we go to eukaryotic cells uh, and we, let's say we isolate all the components of a cell. But, and then do a system biology approach, either on the metabolize or name it. But what we're doing then is that we are completely crushing the organelles. And so we assume that any metabolite present in the cell could interact with another, even though like from, let's say, morphological studies, we know they're organelles, mm. and that probably not every metabolite in the overall cell would be prone to interact with another. Yes. So that is like a problem I have with some of the basic assumptions in some forms of system biology. Yeah, so that's maybe a, a bias that some of the kind of top-down approaches in systems biology have. They think, oh, we have these genome-wide data. They, uh, they show that everything correlates with everything else. Mm -hmm. And we build these big interaction maps where we have complex networks where everything is interacted. And they neglect the fact that, well, based on what we know about the architecture of the cells, these two things cannot, I mean, they never see each other. 
Um, so there's certainly this bias, but as I said, I mean there are very different ways of, of, of modeling and of describing uh, biological systems and systems biology. And um, I mean many people take into account that there are compartments, and of course this makes modeling even more. And I think, if I understood you right, and I would like to, to comment on that, I think you misrepresented um, the, the way the geneticists and molecular biologists uh, approach the questions, in the sense that um, we don't have, I mean, I don't have any uh, a priori bias of uh, whether the, the simple, simplest theory is more likely or less likely to be true. It's just that it's a, a, the, the, it's a matter of the approach of the problems that the what hypothesis you test first, rather than, uh, which kind of uh, touches what you said about Popper, the falsifiability, it's, it's, uh, it's easier to, to, to test. Um, and, and, and we do understand that the, the biological phenomena we're working on are very complex, and we don't want to present that they are simple. It's just that we vary one parameter at a time, everything else equal. So that's, it's just a different, uh, experimental approach, and I actually, maybe you didn't mention enough the experimental uh, uh, part of the, of the problem, but it's uh, just uh, the, the Occam's razor, I thought, maybe I was wrong of uh, my understanding of Occam's razor, it's the, the, the criteria you use to choose what experiment you do first. Not that I think that the simplest explanation is more likely to be true, uh, but it's simpler to do an experiment with less parameters to test. Yes. Um, oh. So, so, did I get it wrong, or did you misrepresent? Well, it? I, I, firstly, I really, I, I agree with you that there's uh, yet another role for Occam's razor that I we didn't really touch upon, which is this uh, methodological role, of not of which theory is more likely to, do, to be true or like epistemically better, but in what order should I test theories in order to be efficient? So that's. There are also debates on that question, so there are people who think we can uh, we can defend uh, that version of, of Occam's razor, uh, but I didn't really touch on that. Um, well, whether I misrepresented that part, I'm, I'm not sure, because I fully agree with you that I don't think that the molecular biologists think the systems must be simple a priori. That my, my point was that they don't, they don't I mean, they, they know that the biology is complex. They know that all things might interact with all other things. And I was, I was precisely saying that they have other reasons to, to, to then uh, expect maybe simple or end up uh, with, with simple mechanistic accounts. Or at least they represent them in this manner for reasons that can be justified. So I'm not sure if there's disagreement here. Well, that was my question. Is that mm -hmm. Maybe you could elaborate just a little bit about what you said <coughs> at the beginning, which was that you see in systems biology many people who are tempted by holism, by being holistic, and maybe also philosophers of systems biology. Maybe you can say more about this, like reductionism, holism, we know it's a spectrum, but you said something like you don't really buy the you know, kind of holism that is uh, at the moment uh, favored by many. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's related to that point. Mm -hmm. I think that it's, I mean, People are very quick to, to criticize reductionism, right? But when it comes to uh, providing a concrete alternative, uh, how to avoid being reductionistic in uh, actual, uh, in the practical situation, um, and it's much more difficult. What would be the alternative holistic approach? And the other thing is that you, uh, and that's precisely part of the argument, that maybe molecular biology looks more reductionistic than it is. So if you just look at these simple cartoon diagrams, you get the idea they can be serious about it. It's much more complex than that. But I was trying to show, well, it's consistent. You can show these simple cartoon diagrams. You can describe the system in this way. It's helpful to, um, if you cons I mean, if you take into account the kind of evolution of the of the mechanistic account that is behind that. If you take into account that this is cartoon thing is not a static uh, 
compute entity, but it's an evolving thing where people can contribute. And, uh, and that's the difference of that kind of representation from a mathematical model. That can obviously also evolve, but it's, there's, a, there's a conceptual difference between the two. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I just follow up on that? Yeah, it's good. Yeah, but no uh, problem. Do you think we know enough uh, to uh, undertake a systems biology approach? Because uh, coming back to what was being said before, I think that the, the, well, the reason why I'm skeptical about uh, systems biology is that you probably need, need a lot of knowledge uh, to, to, to make predictions, to, to have uh, complex models uh, to, to, to test. Uh, do you think we know enough to make reasonable, do we, do we you know not to have assumptions so that we can compute and try to... Uh, yeah, not, well, not in general, but in certain contexts it works very well, but not in others. And so, I mean, for building a, a whole cell model, we are definitely not there yet. So even though it has been tried, but it's not been a game changer. No? I mean, the whole cell model has been fantastic as an achievement of integrating all this data, but actually biologists Experimental biologists have, have not been super impressed. Also, it, oh well, now it's done. We understand it. We have explained it. We can now use the in silico model, and we don't have to do experiments anymore. So this is, I mean, this is the distant future, maybe. But I mean, if you look at very concrete, specific contexts, um, and yeah, I would argue that yeah, we have to take into account that these two approaches are complementary and have to take uh, have to interact. You cannot leave the traditional reductionistic approach of molecular behind and simply replace it. We need to combine it. So my quick last question. Yes, thank you. So I, I found the presentation very clear and uh, it's, it's a real relevant topic. Uh, so, uh, I, like it a lot. Uh, I have a very general question though, uh, because I've always, always been stuck with uh, that idea of uh, Occam's razor when it's applied to real cases. So maybe you can help here. My my point is very simple. I've, I cannot I cannot think of just one example where where it's clear to me that a theory is simpler than another, because it seems to me that it's always related to some complexity. And when you assume simplicity somewhere, you produce complexity elsewhere. Or if you admit uh, complexity of if, yeah, if you accept complexity elsewhere, it's always to keep simplicity. Somewhere. So for instance, you have a current system that you're looking at, observing, and you say, well, it's very complex, there's a lot of stuff in, in it, and so on. And you, would, you don't want to reduce this complexity precisely because you want to keep something else simple. For instance, uh, you, you gave the example of uh, this system, for instance, that you have on the uh, eyes, and it has been shaped like that by or through natural selection. Precisely because you don't want to assume that this system has come with any other uh, process than natural selection, then you you are ready to admit that it's very or highly complex. You see my you see my point? When there's simplicity, when you assume simplicity somewhere, you always assume complexity as well, or accept complexity as well, or produce complexity. As well. I agree that probably this is often the case uh, when you look at maybe very general perspectives, but of course there are one can give clear examples where models are more complex, like when we consider models in mathematical terms. So mm -hmm. A model that has five parameters is more complex than a model with three parameters. And this is where simplicity can be given a very clear meaning, and where simplicity can be ranked. Um, but of course, in, in real complex situations, uh, it's not trivial at all sometimes to, to, to say well, well, which theory is simpler than another, especially when the theory itself is not a formal construct, but something uh, more complex itself. So uh, I would agree with you, but I, yeah, I think that, yeah, maybe we can discuss this. Thank you. Okay, I think it's time to stop, so thank you very much for the